Good afternoon. <laughs> I like to start with the obvious, okay? Uh, in this case, the obvious is being these things. Uh, I used to use my reading glasses, but I've, I've had these. I, the eye doctor prescribed these to me, but I thought they were progressive lenses that you could look far, look close, and then intermediate. But lo and behold, I really discovered that uh, there's no far vision in these, so looking up is just blurry. But there's a medium, this computer distance in the middle, and then reading up close. So <laughs> I paid a lot for these glasses and uh, haven't been able to utilize them because I tried to utilize them uh, for something that they weren't made for. And <laughs> you'd think that the autometrist said we would have got it clear and she would have shared it with me, but her. English is her second language, and it's pretty much limited, uh, and she didn't really, she just assumed what I would need. Most of our lives is spent computer distance and reading distance. And then I have a farsighted lenses for driving. I bought them separately. I started out by buying one for reading and one for farsighted. Uh, but Neither of them worked very well from the computer, and then I discovered. Anyway, enough of that. New. <laughs> Something new. Let's start with the obvious. And the second thing I want to talk about is that will lead me into today's, uh, today's uh, sharing. Uh, and that's about, in my meditation, I've been getting a lot of chakra work. And... I lean towards Zen, of course, and chakras, of course, from a different tradition, the Hindu tradition. But uh, it's useful and it's meaningful for me to study these centers. But what, you know, the seven, the seven obvious, well, the seven traditional chakras: the crown, the third eye, the throat, the heart the solar plexus, the sacral, and the root. I've been doing a lot of work on that. It started off with understanding that when the Blue Buddha, the Medicine Buddha, approached me in a meditation dream state, that he wanted to, he, it, he or she, it's androgynous, of course, uh, wanted to sit, could it, could my body, this is my body was ready to receive him, it, her, pronouns drive me crazy. <laughs> but would I accept the taking up residence in my body? And of course I was overwhelmed. The, the Blue Buddha, the Medicine Buddha from the, from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And it settled in, he settled in, it settled in, she settled in between the throat chakra and the heart chakra. And I went through a rough patch uh, a couple of years ago when, unbeknownst to me, <laughs> my vibratory state was, my body was not vibrating at a high enough level. I had let the mundane pull me down temporarily and long forgotten. I don't know why, but it happened. And the Blue Buddha couldn't stay and it just unannounced was gone. And it took me a while to realize that it wasn't there. It actually, it took, it, it took the whole process again where it came to me again in a meditative dream, shamanic, whatever you call it, state of consciousness. And again, communicated with me that could it come back that my body was back to a high enough vibratory frequency that it could that it could sit within it. And before I get too carried away, I want to share with everybody that there's Buddhist there's a medicine Buddha for you too. It's not my medicine Buddha. Yeah, it's mine because it's in my body, but it can be in all of us at once. 
It's not exclusive. Again, this will lead right into uh, my greater talk today, my greater sharing, or the encompassing, the umbrella. Anyway, I became aware through the work with the Buddha, what the purpose was is that I could, from what I understand, what the Blue Buddha shared with me, the reason it chose this spot to reside was that my voice was my healing tool, my healing apparatus, my healing gift was my voice generated from the throat chakra. And this is how I could heal through words, through vocalization. And there's others, of course, it's by touch, by silence, by many, many, many avenues of healing because we're complex beings and there's a different healing for different aspects, different properties, different aspects, different conditions of our being. Now some are really gifted, like my wife Colleen. She's very much a holistic and she's coming into her own holistic healer. She's working with crystals and stones and of course her meditation and yoga and she's a holistic healer just being around her she's rather as reclusive as i am and two reclusives together and sometimes she needs to be my company is interfering with her reclusiveness and she spends about half of her time at her other house in taipei a two-hour train ride from here, but basically another world from the big city. She's a big city girl from the big city to where we are, where I am in the countryside. And she yearns for that, but I think <laughs> the best thing about Taipei is I'm not there. <laughs> and I mean that with love, you know. She needs to be uh, independent. She needs to have time alone. But her gift is just her presence. And until recently, she wasn't even aware of it. She knew that people liked her, even if she didn't like to be. She suffered from panic attacks when she was younger. She didn't like to be outside, out and about, um, because she didn't have a, she hadn't have enough security that she would be safe. She had a fear because she lacks the root connection, the root chakra, the connection, the defined root chakra, which is security, safety. So anyway, that's a holistic healer, and I'm a different healer. Uh, gifted? Any healer is gifted, but I'm limited to my voice. She told me that I can uh, work with stones, and I'm always wearing this. This is all her creation. Everything that I'm wearing is made with love and light and meditation and understanding on her part. She is intrinsically knows what we need. Here I've got. Uh, orange for sacral, yellow for solar plexus, and green for heart. And over here, the, basically the black and the, the, the dark grays. This is to receive, left hand is to receive, right hand is to generate, to so I exude a grounding effect. People feel safe when they're in my presence, when they're around me. And that's part of the 
healing gift. But I'm talking about chakras now. And I came to understand that. And nothing backs me up. <laughs> I haven't read anything of this. I haven't encountered anything like this. But uh, one of the things that helped me expand this limiting the seven chakras. Well, actually, there's the chakras go up and go down. So the idea there's only seven chakras is not so. But seven chakras in the body, which is actually not even true in itself because the crown chakra sits above the body and the other six are located within the body. But anyway, the Blue Buddha told me that, at least in my case, that he was sitting on, he, she, it was sitting on, I'm tired of pronouns, so I'll try to switch, okay? That she was sitting on another chakra, somewhere between the green of the heart and the blue of the throat. A different chakra, a less no, lesser known. But the presence of the blue Buddha enhanced, grew, my awareness of something between here and here. Okay. And now on the bottom part of the body, root chakra, which I definitely have a solid grasp, a solid groundedness. My root chakra is my rock. My root chakra is responsible for my calmness, my equanimity, my ability to always find a safe harbor. Really, the big gift was eliminating fear. And of, of all the fears to eliminate, first it's the ego that eliminate the ego seems so fearful. And then it's the fear of death. And ironically, the death of the ego is necessary for the birth of awakening. So this idea of birth and death, the interlocking wheel, this continuous motion from being born and moving towards death and dying and what becoming aware at another level. So it takes death for renewal. It takes death for rebirth. So anyway, that fear, that groundedness, it, it, one of the consequences, one of the gifts it gives me is a fearlessness. There's nothing that I'm afraid of. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So I have this solid and then I understood that the next one up is sacral. And I want to mention here that a lot of this taking a new look at the chakras, the seven traditional body chakras, or the six plus, the crown. But it's usually included, if you read, you'll say seven chakras, even though the seventh is above not within, confined within the body, but a thing called human design, which talk, took the chakra centers and expanded it to, uh, to ten instead of seven. So on the right side, you would have emotive, which I would call solar plexus now in the seventh system. And then you have the spleen, which is the uh, intrinsic, intrinsic, awareness of survival, animals, instinct, perception, all come, clairvoyance, everything comes from this side of the spleen. Now, the traditional, we just had the solar plex in the middle, but I've been learning that the solar plexus is separated and has two completely different yin and yang emotional wave and the steadiness 
of survival. The, 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 the emotional is in the past, it's in the future, it's in this continual wave of ups and downs, whereas the spleen, the instinct, the survival has to remain steady because if you're not tuned in to survival, and I'm talking about the basic levels of survival, your first instinct, and I learned long ago, that's the voice I listen to, and it's a soft, it whispers compared to emotion that screams, mental that drowns out everything, but it's that first inclination and to be able to respond. So human design, maybe look at the chakra system, check it out, it's really worth, there's a lot of good things in there. And I really re recommend, today I'm gonna to recommend a few things. Let me do it right now. Human design, Ra Uruhu, check it out. John Martin's a dear friend. That's a good place to start if you're more of a maverick. If you're more of a traditional, you can go to uh, Human Design International or international human design and get a more hmm, what's the word anyway John Martin uh, Hawaii human design check him out if you're like I, I am a maverick type and he'll resonate maybe he, he talks of the way of the wire and uh, maybe he will resonate there's a, there's a lot of people in this human design world and I spend a lot of time and there's aspects of human design I'm talking about now that help me in my spiritual studies and one of the, the one of the main mandates of human design is the brain is not made for planning or thinking or the future or all the things that we tend to depend on it for mistakenly and then I want to branch out to people that I find on the internet my it's gotten a little bit bigger recently but Dennis Harris Dennis Harris does a lot of nice he does photographs and he puts mess, short messages it's, it's a different format but it's really I don't know he does where Dennis Dennis where do you get those photos I love them a lot of them I reshare on my uh, Hi Young Zendo page. But he and he puts he either puts his own thoughts, but it's usually succinct and the picture is all encompassing and it's a really effective way I find really meaningful. So that's Dennis Harris. The other one is Adyashanti, which I've been who I've been somebody that I've been following uh, since I saw him the first year, 1993, I, I believe, the within the first year of him publicly going out and uh, sharing his awakened state with his Buddhahood with people. And I was fortunate enough to be in a small audience at University of Hawaii. I believe 1993 or 90, early 94, but I think late 93, uh, Adya Shanti, he's a, a Westerner from Northern California, but he's steeped in the Zen tradition and he does a lot of YouTube stuff that's really I recommend, Adya Shanti. And then, of course, Sadhguru. And Sadhguru is somebody that I've come to more recently. And a lot of his stuff really resonates with me. So these are the people that I Sometimes I went through a period of time where I didn't want to hear what anyone had to say, and now I'm back with a little bit of curiosity again to not looking for validation, but just looking for. We all have our own, you know, we're limited by words, and we're all able to choose different words. And sometimes people have a gift. I have a gift with words, I'm a wordsmith, but other people have different gifts and express this similar thing that I remember and maybe put it a different way or more succinctly or and that's what I find interesting uh, whether or not it agrees with mine is of no import but it touches me as meaningful so Sadhguru 
and of course, my old, my first guru who passed along in 1953 or 50, 50, 1953, Parahamsa Yogananda. And even though he was the, he steeped his messages in the, because he was lecturing in the, spent most of his life in America, so he incorporated a lot of the Christianity uh, so that it could, it's more relatable for most, but I find the Eastern tradition much more relatable, but to each his own. But anyway, his beautiful soul, I've been to his resort there near his, uh, his ashram or his, his uh, place near Malibu, uh, above, the, above Malibu, on the mountains there, Santa Monica Mountains, I guess it is. Beautiful place to walk around and uh, you can, it's very beautiful to sit I understand part of his ashes are in a little, are spread in part of the, part of his uh, retreat. Anyway, you can go there and feel a, a real good connection. But this idea that I separated the uh, solar plexus to two, and two distinct, even though they share the same same orange color no sorry sacral is orange yellow is solar plexus they say they share the same yellow below the heart but Depending on which, you can go to human design and find out, they call it defined centers. If you have a defined emotional center, that side of your solar plexus, you inescapably in the wave of emotions. And you learn that you have to go, you have to ride out the cycle before you're prepared to make a decision. You have to experience, you see, it's connected deeply with the lunar cycle, the 28 plus day cycle of the moon and you should go through a whole lunar period before you make a yes or a no. Whereas this side, this instinctual, this survival, this you have to hear the voice immediately and it never repeats itself and it's soft and you have to be tuned into it because this can mean the difference between life and death. So on one side you're caught in a wave, inescapable wave of postponing decision making this this side of the same energy, the same solar plexus energy, but expressed in the polar opposite. You have to respond. And so this I think it's harder for people that are emotionally defined to be in the moment because uh, they're caught up in their cycle. And I think you would have to take a lot of training to accept the cycle because it's irresistible as the moon, the influence is the moon of all bodies of water, including us, is hard to escape. But uh, I'm sure emotionally defined people are able to somehow intuitively be in the moment while being in the cycle, in a particular part of the cycle, they can recognize it. But decision making, and this the central body is where the decision making, from from the sacral to the heart, is where the decision making process. It's not up here; it should be uh, in here, or at least in the trunk of the body. So I found myself thinking of myself as a, I have the root and I have this spleen and I have the crown chakra, my third eye has been opened as long as I can remember and I have the throat fully defined. So I have this and I have this and I, so it's like I likened it today in my meditation while I was sitting down before I came and talked to you today. I uh, visualized that the roots, the earth, the roots are in the earth. The head is in the air. It's 
fire and water that's within the body and I'm not in touch I got this this lower body the, the root to find the head to find but in here is the great unknown other than part half of a solar plexus that keeps me tuned it's my survival it's my instinct it's my instant knowing I know now If I can listen to this soft voice again that doesn't repeat itself. So here's my addition to the chakras, you know. Thanks to human design with the idea of 10, uh, I've added the chakra between the throat and the heart. And I've added another aspect. I've taken the solar plexus. Maybe it's a band, right? It's a band across the body just above the sacral and see that one half and other half and I guess if you had both that you probably be a more balanced individual but you know I've never been balanced I want to balance in, uh, something that I've struggled with okay. now this is my this is my preamble <laughs> and I see that I'm at 26 minutes already and I want to get to what prompted me to get up from my meditation chair that's out in my converted garage in my high young zendo I was sitting in deep meditation when I had to come upstairs where my computer where my computer is set up that's where I do my sharings on the second floor and I'll go back to my meditation, but I just was drawn. And what I felt was, I just was, you know, something, it takes, I read something and it prompts me. There's a Mr. Kenneth Leong who's really brilliant and I really appreciate his thinking. I believe he comes from Hong Kong. And he has a, column about Taoism and the column about Zen and I just noticed in his Taoist column he's opened it up for all of us to make comments anybody that wants to can make a comment but he's asked that to keep them separate Buddhism Zen Zazen is in one page one group and Taoism and he doesn't want people putting Buddhist I guess it muddies the water it's not pure I don't really get the separation and it made me realize that my own study kudos to him and bless him and he's trying to modernize he's even taken the Western view uh, and trying to reconcile and trying to find the commonalities but at the same time this separation and division Taoism is here and Zen is here that's why if you look under the uh, if you look under this the, 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 the topics of this uh, of my sharings in Hai Young Zendo on my web on my Facebook I'll get it right my YouTube page it lists Taoism and Hinduism I mean Taoism and Buddhism and I already talking I'm talking about chakras that's Hinduism so what I for me what resonates with me and I'm reading that say please don't please just restrict your comments don't talk about Buddhism or the Taoist and I thought, mm, this, why, why are we going to separate? This is the whole, whole problem with any kind of organized religion is the people that, the followers, they start getting, they start having these esoteric kind of arguments and it divides and separates and becomes, you know, look how many kinds of Christianity there are, look how many kinds of Buddhism there are, look at how many kinds of uh, Hinduism, all the way to the extent of the extreme nationalism that has nothing to do with the Hindu spirit, the Hindu origins but this is a human failing but anyway I want to share about commonality and inclusiveness this is my own propensity this is not to criticize Mr. Leong or other people that want to entertain things separately I'm sure that works for them and it's useful for a lot of people and it resonates for a lot of people. But for me, anything that promotes s separateness, division, just is problematic. 
So I look for commonalities. And that's why I'm able to coexist with Hinduism and Zen and uh, Buddhism and uh, Tibetan Buddhism and Mahayana and Hinayana and all the other myriad in between. I can just, it doesn't have to be either or. Mix them up. <laughs> Again, that's all on me. And because I don't, there's been, an, it's enough, there's enough ways for us to be divided, especially in these polarizing times. No matter where you are in the world, you're, you're living in a polarized society, either whether it's the haves and the have-nots, or the right or the left, the fascists or, or the, the Nazis or the brown shirts or the uh, communists or the socialists or wherever on this political range. But people is just either or and it's exclusive. Here we have a blue party uh, and we have a national, blue party is a nationalistic party, KMT, Kuomintang from China and the green party is the DPP locally grown. One favors Taiwan independence, stresses Taiwan independence, and the other is unity with the great mother China. But it's a division. It's a gap that can't be bridged. So I'm living in a I come from a society that's suffering polarization. I guess it's a worldwide phenomenon. And that's why I want to be a voice. I want to be a voice for commonality. Find things that you can incorporate into your her view, your worldview, your teachings, your understanding, your acceptance, and include instead of exclude. So we're looking at these dualities, and in the daily world, dualities are not without their purpose, even though the truth of non-dualistic, that you know that, Democrat, Republican, left or right, preordained destiny. It's all part of the same, uh, the unity, the, the oneness of non-duality. But duality is not without its purpose as long as we're in this world that most people live in and accept as a dualistic right or wrong, either or, bad or good, up or down. Easy or hard, tall or short, skinny or fat. We live in these white or black. We live in these polarized, divisive times. And it's time to heal. And healing is about including everything. Healing is about finding the commonalities, not the differences. Nurturing the common elements, including one and all. Because the opposite of this, stressing the non-commonality, the differences, stressing the excluded from the included, it only leads to deeper and deeper resentments and fears and hatreds and wars and suffering and jealousy. And these, of course, are all things that we want to avoid at all costs. 